Mr. Mayor, Mr. Burslow, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Michael Clennett and I'm Deputy Head at Sutton High School. On behalf of the Headmistress, Mrs. Crouch, who is sadly not able to be with us today, I'd like to welcome you here to Sutton High this evening. As an all-girls school, we are very proud of the fact that our girls love science, maths and technology, and that very many study science, maths and technology at A-level and beyond. It's therefore brilliant that we're hosting this Science Box event this evening, and that the idea came for it from some of our girls. Civilization being built on a scientific approach, how our economy is a knowledge based economy, one that has to be built on internet. And he, like others, saw science as being something that has to be seen as part of our popular culture. So perhaps we should have had things can only get better as the, uh, the music, or maybe not. Um, so I just want to say a few words by, by way of introduction to this uh, and really to say thank you to Megan and Elizabeth. Uh, I think their Science Rocks project. Uh, it's making science accessible uh, and I think it's taking on a life of its own in some ways in terms of how it's clearly developed. I had a chance earlier today to look at the uh, website and view some of the 30 uh, videos that are shown on that site. Uh, I particularly enjoyed watching the uh, video about uh, does, uh, why does your heart beat faster when you exercise? Uh, and indeed, uh, 397 other people must have done because they watched that one. I loved the great exothermic reactions that you were generating. That was fantastic, really uh, engaging. I think probably my favourite video of all was the one on DNA, and you can see the model that was shown in the video at the back there. And 150 other people have viewed that. I think probably for me, the thing that was most useful about that was that I can now blame my smelly feet on my jeans, not on uh, my socks. And that was really a very good thing to know. Um, I'm told that uh, so far this website has reached 115 different countries, although there is some geographical dispute as to whether some, some of these places are actually countries or just islands and parts of countries. But it is fantastic that it is achieving that sort of reach, and that does show the power of social media. So I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I know the Mayor is as well, uh, and I really want to uh, wish uh, you both great success next March when you compete in the National Science and Engineering Finals as part of the Big Bang uh, Initiative, so good luck with that. Uh, and um, just uh, again in with something Brian Cox said in the interview that he gave on, on Monday, which I thought was great. He said, when, he, when asked, well, what, 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 why does science matter? And he said that science uh, offers access. It offers access to joy and to wonder. And I thought that's a pretty compelling reason to be interested in it. But then he paused and he said, and it also offers access to riches. And that's a rather important thing to keep in mind too, and why we should all be interested in science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Burstow, and thank you everybody for coming this afternoon. We would like to welcome you to the Science Rocks first anniversary lecture. 
We would particularly like to thank Mr Paul Burster for taking time to be here today and our Mayor and Mayoress for rearranging their diary so that they could attend. We would also like to welcome Libby Bickerless, Deputy Director of Learning and Kat Scott, the Head, Creati the head of Creative Learning from GDST and also Gordon Ironside, Headmaster at Sutton Grammar School. And we would especially like to welcome Anne-Marie Imifidden and Kate Huston from SEMEX, a real driving force in encouraging schoolgirls and female graduates to follow careers in STEM subjects. <coughs> now I would like to introduce Lindsay Liu from Subsea 7, one of the world's largest engineering contractors to the offshore industry. Please can you welcome Lindsay Liu. So today I'll talk a little bit about what is engineering. Subsea 7, the company I work for, and Subsea Engineering, which is what we do. My career and the opportunities that I've had, and also opportunities within engineering in general. So what is engineering? Well, if you Google the term engineer, these are often pictures that you might see. Uh, it tends to be men wearing hard hats and overalls working on site, or a guy very happy fixing his washing machine, or men working with uh, wires and electricity. I don't know about you, but for me, as a teenager trying to decide what I wanted to do, this wasn't exactly images that enticed me into engineering. However, the reality can be very different. These are all things that are engineering. If you look at the Shard, one of the most iconic buildings in London, yes, an architect designed it, but an engineer is the one that does the important bit. We make sure that it actually stands up, we plan how we build this structure, and we manage the construction process. An iPad, it's engineers that design iPads, electrical engineers, software engineers, these are the ones that allow us to use these. And finally, Formula One cars, it's mechanical engineers that are involved in designing these cars. When I was at university, uh, the mechanical engineering students actually got to design, build, and race their own Formula One type cars against other universities. So these are just some of the things that you should get involved in if you decide to go down the route of engineering. So in terms of what we do at Sub-C7, this image maybe isn't the clearest, but it's trying to illustrate the fact that we work offshore in the oil and gas sector. And what we do is we design, build and install the pipelines and structures that takes oil and gas from the well down in the seabed all the way to the platforms or onshore. We do this all over the world. Shore. 
The cables are electrical and fiber optic, um, which allow us to connect into the structures, which are basically control centers that allow us to control all the operations that are happening subsea and to take that oil and gas ashore. So in doing this, we need such a wide variety of engineers. You have the people based in the office who are doing mainly maths and physics, designing these structures, how they're going to work, um, and also looking at how you're going to install them offshore. We work in oceans such as the North Sea, where you can have very bad weather in December, and you have to think about all these things when you're working out how you're going to install them. We also have people who enjoy them offshore, so they're the engineers that go and manage the construction process, making sure that things are done as they should be and safely and placed onto the bottom of the seabed. So even within just our company, there's a huge different uh, range of opportunities that engineers can get involved in. And for me, that's one of the things that I really like about engineering, is that it gives you a wide range of things that you can do. You're not just focused on one area. So in terms of how we actually install these things offshore, we uh, use divers a lot of the time. So they are there, supervising when we lift things with the vessel, tying things into, into place. But also in the deeper waters, we can't use divers. So we have ROVs, which are basically like underwater robots. And we control these and use them to tie things in and make sure that all the operations are happening as they should. <coughs> and to put this into a bit of perspective, if you look on the right hand side, that's the Eiffel Tower. And this is the depth that we work at. So we can have divers going as far down as 200 metres. So we, to be able to do this, they have to actually stay in pressurised containers on the vessel for up to 28 days. And from that, they then go into a diving bell and are lowered subsea. And they work there um, to install all our items. However, at the deeper depths, for example, in Norway, in the west of Africa, off coast Brazil, at these really deep depths, we can't use divers. So this is when it comes into play with the ROVs. So we're a bit like a construction company, but the thing is that we're not onshore, so we can't be there doing the work. Our challenge is that we're in a vessel at the surface, and we have to design everything and control it for something that's taking place thousands of meters below. Also, in terms of all the places we work, we work all over the world and we have many different work sites. So, for example, um, you can work in an office, you're based there, that's where you go every day. But you might also have the opportunity, if you wanted, to go to the, our bases, which we have, where we build our uh, structures, where we construct our pipelines. A lot of the time, for example, we can construct a pipeline along that entire line you can see there in the picture. The vessel then comes and we reel the pipeline onto the vessel. The vessel then goes offshore and then it starts really pipeline off into its location as it sails away. We also, this is one of our main vessels, the Borealis, but we have over 40 different vessels. So some of these vessels focus on diving, we have other ones that have the lay equipment which allows us to install pipelines, we have other heavy <coughs> lift vessels for the big structures. So as an engineer you can get to go offshore in these vessels and see the operations happening. As I mentioned, we're a worldwide company, so there's lots of opportunity for travel. And this is something that is across the engineering industry. It's a great profession to get into if you want to travel the world. So for example, I started in Aberdeen and I got to move down to the London office. But you could also work in Australia, Brazil, America, Canada. There's so many opportunities. So in terms of me and my career and how I got into engineering, and so I just might get my accent, I'm Scottish. Still part of the UK. Um, <laughs> I studied at Lanark Grammar School, um, and I guess a lot like people here today, um, my favourite subject were maths and science, and I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to be a doctor, I didn't want to be a vet, I didn't want to be a dentist. They're the main things that when you're doing maths and science people tell you about. But um, my mum suggested engineering. I knew it was using maths and science, but in a practical application, and also on projects, so you're all constantly getting new challenges and also there was the opportunity to travel. So I liked the sound of that and decided to go and study civil engineering at the University of Dundee. So I did a master's there and was there for five years. Um, and whilst I was at university, I did summer placements on a construction site. So I worked for Sir Robert McAlpine, you might have heard of him, the company that built the Olympic Stadium. So I worked in one of the biggest projects in Scotland at the time. So we were extending a motorway, the M74. So the M8 runs between Glasgow and Edinburgh, the M74 goes um, between Carlisle down to the south, um, sorry, from further north in Scotland down to Carlisle. And this motorway is going through the centre of Glasgow to, make, to connect the two. 
So in doing that, we had to cross the West Coast Main Line, the River Clyde, the existing motorway. It's a huge engineering project, and you can see, hopefully, from the scales there, the size of the bridge, you can see the cars below. So it was a great project to work on. But as a female, I was often, well, the only female on site. But I didn't necessarily find that a bad thing. I was always respected, and people always took their time to teach me things. Um, and I definitely think it's getting better. There's a lot more females going into the industry. However, after my summers on site, I decided it wasn't necessarily the route I wanted to go down. So I decided to join Sub C7. This is on the graduation. And this was my intake at Sub C7 in Aberdeen. So again, there wasn't too many girls, but definitely getting more and more coming in. So I joined a graduate scheme, which a lot of engineering companies have. Um, and in the graduate scheme, you get to rotate around different departments. So you get to try lots of different types of engineering and see what you enjoy the most. So I had a couple of placements which were office based. So designing some of the things I showed earlier. So we were looking at structures. It's a lot of math, it's a lot of physics, but it's something that I really enjoyed. I also did geotechnical engineering. So that's looking at the soil conditions offshore. So we go offshore with our vessels, we survey the seabed, we take samples of the soil, and we understand what's there so that we make sure when we install our structures they don't sink. So in that I was designing foundations um, and I was lucky enough to get to go offshore and see some of that happening. I also had places where it was a lot more offshore based. So I was working and planning on how we were going to install these structures. Uh, I had my first trip offshore in the North Sea in December, which was an experience. Um, I discovered sea sickness, which is not pleasant. Um, but it was, yeah, it was brilliant. It was nothing like I'd ever seen. I think when you work in the office you realise the scale of these things. When you have a drawing, everything looks very small. And these structures are massive, so it's really it's a brilliant thing to get to see. But I want to emphasise that I think a lot of the time females see these pictures of working on site or going offshore, and it's not necessarily that something appealing. I don't think it would have been appealing to me, but I think what you need to think is it's a choice to go down that route. You can still do engineering and work in an office, but you can have the choice of going offshore or going on site if that's what you want to do. These are also a very good part of my graduate scheme. So because Sub-C7 is a global company, uh, like other engineering companies, we did global training. So I worked with graduates from Brazil, from Australia, America. I went to Paris for two weeks to do that. I went to Norway for two weeks and Aberdeen for two weeks. And I got to learn from um, all the different cultures and the different ways of working from all over the world. Also that picture up at the top, we got to go to Rotterdam where we saw one of these big vessels being constructed. Um, it was huge, I can go over the scale of it, but it was brilliant to see. And even now I'm still in another development programme, where again we get to do a lot more travelling. So this is up as in Aviemore, up in the north of Scotland, doing outdoor activities. And in May I'm going to go to Sweden to go canoeing um, and camping. So they're all about developing engineers, there's a lot of skills about teamwork, about leadership, um, and companies really want to try and encourage you to develop those. And also in terms of travelling, um, I've been lucky enough to get to go to lots of different places. So I've been to Norway, I got to go to WIC where I was seeing before we launched those uh, pipelines and structures. And I also went to Ghana for the building fabrication yards in so the west of Africa, which was an experience, but a very good one. Um, it's definitely if it's something you're interested in, I wouldn't recommend engineering enough as a career to let you get to travel. And as I mentioned earlier, offshore, this tends to be the image I think that people have of going offshore. Covered in dirt, sitting at lots of machinery. This is not the reality of offshore for most of it. This tends to be what offshore looks like at some season. Nice leather couches, <laughs> TV. <laughs> uh, it is very different out here. We have an office. We're not the ones doing the manual dirty work. We're the people overseeing that making sure it's done correctly um, and yeah, it's apart from the seasickness which you may get used to but in Africa you get sunshine, you have barbecues on the best cell, it's, it's totally different <laughs> but uh, again, it's whatever aspect you want to get into, there's opportunity there and that's something that I really wanted to focus on today I decided to go down the route of oil and gas but if you study engineering, there are so many different industries you can go into you can go into flood risk and um, drainage, you can go into nuclear energy, chemical engineering, uh, aeroplanes, whatever you want. And it's even that, if you decide to go down into engineering, um, it's something that's a really highly regarded degree. So even at the end of it, if you decide you don't want to do engineering, 
then if you move down another route. There are so many people who work in finance, who work in computing and business, who have got an engineering degree. And I think when I was at school trying to decide what I wanted to do, um, I was, it panicked me that I had to decide what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I think having gone through university and into engineering, it's seen that there is actually a huge flexibility. You don't have to commit to one thing and you can see what you enjoy and decide to go down that route. But um, if any of you are interested in engineering,